Welcome to the recorded version of Hospital to Home Preparation for Seniors, part of the Family Caregiver Support Webinar Series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. All right, our presenter today is going to be Lakeland Hogan. Lakeland is the Caregiver Advocate for Home Instead Senior Care. She holds a graduate certificate in gerontology and is currently working toward a Master of Arts in Social Gerontology. She also holds a Master's in Business Administration and her undergraduate education focused on marketing and communication studies. Lakeland has professional experience in the private and public sectors of senior care services. She's worked on special projects for the University of Nebraska Omaha's Department of Gerontology and the local area agency on aging. She is also active in her local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Lakeland has experience assisting senior clients and helping their families navigate the senior care continuum. She's passionate about helping others, especially aging adults and their families. Um, coming up later on in the Q&A session, uh, joining us is going to be Lenita Noki, who is a registered nurse with a bachelor's in business management. Lenita is also a certified manager, managed care nurse with a varied background in nursing encompassing direct care and clinical business. So Lenita is going to be joining us for the last 15 minutes for Q&A. But at this point in the presentation, I would like to turn the floor over to Lakeland Hogan, who is going to be our presenter for today. Thanks again for being here with us today, Lakeland. Thanks so much, Steve. Hello, everyone. Um, happy holidays. I hope it's a lot warmer where you are than it is here in Nebraska. Um, but I guess that comes with the month of December. So anyway, uh, today we're going to cover a topic um, that's kind of been one of those hot topics over the past couple of years, and that's preventing hospital readmissions. And it's kind of timely that we're talking about that over the winter months because we see a lot of, um, especially elderly people, uh, going into the hospital uh, for things such as falls or influenza, those types of things. Uh, so again, it's kind of a timely topic. Uh, but I'm going to look at it through the lens of us as professionals and what we can help people or how we can help people who are being discharged home from the hospital make a successful transition home uh, and or to their community uh, living situation and then hopefully re uh, avoid readmissions, especially whenever possible. So. On the next slide, I'm going to go over the objectives for today. I'm going to start by reviewing some of the statistics and why people are admitted, readmitted to the hospital. I'm also going to cover some ways to prepare an elderly adult um, home, uh, how I'm going to go over some different checklists and pointers for the family caregivers as well. Uh, I'm going to identify some warning signs that we can communicate to the families, uh, signs that the caregivers should be looking for in the first hours and days home and, and of course, those 30 days after uh, discharge from a hospital. And then also, uh, at Home Instead, we did a pilot study uh, in conjunction with the hospital to see if home care uh, after a hospital discharge can help reduce readmissions. So I'm going to share the results of that pilot with you. Uh, and then, as always, I'm going to discuss some resources, and then Lanita will join us for questions at the end. Um, she's a great wealth of knowledge on this topic uh, as well. So before we dive in, I wanted to just get a, an idea of who we have on the call today. Uh, so we have a quick poll for you. And once it's up on the screen, you'll go ahead and uh, select uh, the uh, the item that best describes you. So are you a social worker, a discharge planner, a nurse? Uh, if you're neither of those, are you an other healthcare professional? Are you a family caregiver? Or if none of those fit uh, your title or your job, you can always select other. So we'll see who we have on the call. All right, so we have lots of social work and discharge planners. Uh, Again, a good topic for you all. You work with a lot of discharge planning after they go home from the hospital. Looks like some other healthcare professionals. And then the other category always has a pretty good representation. So one of these days, I'm going to ask people who classify themselves as other to type in their profession for me. But we'll maybe get to that in the new year. All right, so we'll move on to reasons for readmission on the next slide. So all of these changes in regulation around hospital readmissions have come about because of the frequency of people, especially seniors, who are readmitting to the hospital within 30 days of discharge. And that equates to about one in five seniors are being readmitted. And this is costing the healthcare system a lot of money each year to the tune of about $15 billion. And these stats uh, come back from about 
2012. So they are a little bit dated, and I know we'll talk about more recent numbers and how those readmission rates have gone down. Um, but again, these are some numbers that sparked conversation, especially among Medicare, because they are the largest payer of health care for those 65 and older. Um, you can imagine that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, or CMS, were interested in, you know, why are people readmitting? This is costing us a lot of money, and what can we do about it? So let's talk more about why these readmissions are happening on the next slide. So what are the problems leading to avoidable hospital stays? There's a great report published by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's called The Revolving Door, a report on U.S. hospital readmission. And I'll share a link to that report at the end of, of the presentation today. It's a really good, thorough report. It takes a look at, um, again, why these hospital readmissions are happening, especially here in the U.S. Uh, and in the report, Dr. Risa Leviso more uh, that's quite the name. Uh, she's president and CEO of the foundation. She talks about readmissions as a result of a fragmented system of care that too often leaves discharged patients to their own devices, unable to follow up on instructions they didn't understand, and not taking medications or getting, up, getting to those necessary follow-up care appointments. And at the same time, hospital systems, they have historically had little financial incentive to ensure that their patients got the care they needed once they left the hospital. Oftentimes, the hospitals were actually financially benefit benefiting when the patients didn't recover and they had to return to the hospital for more treatment. So as many of you know, that model is certainly changing, um, especially with the hospital readmission reduction program. Um, so we're going to take a closer look at what that program looks like here on the next slide. And since many of you are social workers and discharge planners, you're probably becoming more familiar with this program. Um, so this might not be new information, but wanted to get everyone up to speed. Um, I want to start out by clearly defining what a hospital readmission is. And uh, in this case, we're talking mostly about those avoidable hospital readmissions. Uh, but a hospital readmission occurs when a patient is admitted to the hospital within a specific a specified time period after being discharged from an earlier or initial hospitalization. And for Medicare, this time is time period is defined as 30 days. And that uh, includes hospital readmissions to any hospital, not just the one where the patient was originally or initially hospitalized. So let's say uh, Mrs. Jones gets discharged from Hospital A, and even if she were to return to the hospital within 30 days to Hospital B, it would still be considered a readmission. But this chart just uh, kind of shows you the three phase implementation of the hospital readmission program. So you can see at the top of the chart, it shows the year uh, that the penalties apply, and then the per performance period. And then the diagnosis of initial hospitalization. So they really kind of focused on um, a select group of diagnoses. Uh, but in fiscal year 2015, COPD and the hip and knee replacements were added to heart attack, heart failure, and pneumonia. So um, hospitals first became eligible for penalties in 2013 based on uh, the readmission rates during the performance period. Um, and clearly these incentives for hospitals to keep their admissions down or these penalties are driving hospitals to figure out ways to reduce readmissions. So I wanted to give you a visual of how this is working on the next slide. So since 2008, hospitals have been working to implement different processes and procedures to reduce readmissions in their respective hospital systems. And because of this, readmission rates are likely to vary across the country. Um, and as I was doing research and gathering information for this presentation, there was a whole chart that listed all 50 states um, and their respective readmission rates. Obviously, I, I didn't want to bore you with all that information. But specifically from 2010 to 2015, there were 43 states in which the readmission rate fell by 5%. And then there were 11 states where the readmission rate fell by more than 10%. Um, and if you're interested in looking up your state's specific readmission rate, you can go to the CMS 
blog, and all that information is there. Um, but if we look at readmission rates kind of as a whole across the U.S., you can see by the chart on this slide, and I apologize that it's a little blurry. Um, I took it from the source listed there from the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, but overall, readmission rates are trending uh, in the right direction. So these pen penalties, again, are incentivizing these hospital systems to take a look at the patient readmissions and why they're happening, trying to reduce them. So that top line, the blue line there, shows readmission rates for the targeted conditions that we just mentioned on the chart on the previous slide, uh, but there's also a coinciding decline in the non-targeted conditions, and that's shown on the red line. So again, things are trending in the right direction. Hospital systems are implementing efforts to reduce readmissions, especially to those targeted conditions, but it's having a larger impact on all conditions, which is a good thing. So, uh, but while it seems when you're just talking about reducing readmissions, it seems like it could be so simple, but as we all know, it's very complex. So we're going to take a closer look at those complexities on the next slide. So when we talk about readmission to the hospital, we, um, we know that some readmissions are unavoidable. So I listed a few reasons here. You know, people might go back for an already scheduled treatment. Uh, they might have been too weak when they were first admitted, and because of that weakness, they weren't able to have all the treatment they needed, so they have to go back uh, and get that treatment uh, taken care of. Others might have been discharged for one condition or illness. They might go home and have something entirely new crop up or have an accident. Uh, to give you an example of that, I had a client once that was discharged from the hospital. He had uh, a hernia surgery, uh, but he was readmitted a few weeks later because he fell and broke his hip while walking his dog in the park. So as you can see, those, those two things were pretty much completely unrelated but happened to the same individual. Um, and then, uh, so as you can see, some, some readmissions uh, are unavoidable, but many are unavoidable. And we're going to take a closer look on the next slide of the drivers uh, of those avoidable readmissions. So the, re the revolving door report that I referenced earlier uh, had identified some of the reasons for avoidable readmissions. And first of all, many patients are discharged without understanding their illness and their discharge plans. This is not to say that they weren't given instructions on what to do when they went home. It just means that they may not have understood the instructions or may not have had the means to follow up on those instructions. Patients with chronic conditions, they always pose a particular challenge. Many times, hospital staffs, um, they may not complete teachings on their chronic conditions because they assume that the patient already understands their disease process and how to care for that condition. Uh, and the study actually gave a few examples um, that happened with two specific patients. They both had diabetes, and neither of them had a clear grasp on what their diet should be and how to adjust their insulin levels based on their diet. And uh, one of them even was... Um, not clear on how to properly inject their insulin. So I don't know about you, but I'm kind of cringing because I can, I can see in this situation that, you know, they're likely to have a readmission to the hospital if they don't understand these basics about their chronic disease. And patients, again, might not have the means to meet their basic needs or to follow up on the discharge instructions, uh, especially if they include special diets or transportation to appointments or to the pharmacy, and they might not have the finances to pay for new medications or nutritious meals. Um, so there's a few more drivers that are listed on the next slide that we're going to take a look at. And family members can be so important in this whole readmission process but sometimes they're not included in that discharge plan. Um, and it might be that they're even, you know, the central, the primary caregiver, they're not able to be there for some reason um, or miss the memo on, on the discharge plan discussion. So coordination and communication is really important. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, among family members, there's lack of coordination. Uh, sometimes, as we know, uh, seniors often have multiple physicians that they're seeing, and that communication can kind of break down from time to time, um, especially when uh, coordinating post-discharge care. So the revolving door study states that 
most important. Um, the most important uh, driver is the lack of clarity regarding the clinician who's responsible for following up after discharge. So, um, you know, a patient's discharged from the hospital, they might have been seeing a hospitalist uh, or some specialist, but after they leave, they're not sure who to follow up with after. They're not sure which doctor they should go to if they have questions. Um, so there's some kind of accountability problems um, that may lead to an emergency room visit or repeat hospitalizations, because they might just think, well, I'll just go to the ER because I don't know which doctor to contact with my question. And finally, there are times that patients might be too embarrassed to let the staff know that they don't understand the directions they're given. And I've experienced this with my own grandmother. Uh, her doctor started her on a new medication after discharge from the hospital, and I asked her, Grandma, what's this for? And she said, oh, something to do with my blood. Uh, when I asked for more details, she said, well, the doctor spoke so fast, I couldn't understand what he was saying, and I felt silly asking questions. Uh, so she said, I'll just take the medication because he's my doctor. Um, so, of course, my family did some follow-up with the physician just to find out exactly what the medication was for, and we found out it was uh, blood thinner. So, of course, uh, this is a very important medication that we wanted to make sure Grandma was taking, um, and had we not done some more follow-up, um, it could have been detrimental to her health. So, again, they might um, be discouraged from asking questions uh, just because they don't want to look foolish, um, so that's something to keep in mind. But if we, as we transition to the next slide, we're going to look at the readmissions from the patient perspective. Um, and again, this comes from the revolving doors report, um, and again, speaks from the patient's perspective. And so this is why they feel they were readmitted. I thought this was pretty insightful, so I wanted to share it with you. Um, many did not understand their discharge instructions. We've talked about that already. Um, they felt tired, afraid, and kind of in an alien world in the hospital. Um, so a 15-minute uh, overview of their care instructions and pamphlets about their illness they felt were not enough. But those that saw a nutritionist, a physical therapist, or had a little bit more time with a doctor or nurse um, during the discharge planning, they seemed to do better. Um, some felt that their care instructions were too general. Some cases, um, discharge instruction lacked the detail the patients and caregiver needed once they were home. And some wish that their nurses had told them more about what they should eat, what they should avoid, how to sterilize cloths or clean the incision, uh, those types of things. Patients and caregivers also wished that they had been more assertive themselves. A number of times during the interviews, patients would say, perhaps I should have asked more questions. And all the, the patients said having a family member or other caregiver present during discharge made a big difference to them. They also said that they wished they'd been a little more aggressive in asking questions and pushing for details uh, that they needed uh, upon going home. And then some felt that a new diagnosis posed some special challenges. One patient was diagnosed with COPD during the initial hospitalization and felt overwhelmed by the news. He wanted more information, more one-on-one -on -one time, uh, more hands-on training, more follow-up care, and he felt that none of that really occurred while he was there. And then the primary care physicians were missing from the picture. So in a number of cases, cases pardon me, uh, patients left the hospital and were not seen by their primary care physician or their regular specialist. Um, and they gave a number of reasons for this, but a lack of oversight by their own physicians seemed to have played a role somewhat in their readmission. And then some had limited or no support at home. Many patients were single or divorced men who returned home alone, uh, and they were too weak to care for themselves. So you can, you can see that that would be an issue, especially in terms of possible readmission. And some were not ready to change their behaviors, and I'm sure we've all encountered patients, clients like this. Um, there were two patients in particular in this study that did not comply with the care instructions once they left the hospital and engaged in behaviors that put themselves at risk and perhaps even triggered that readmission. In one case, um, the patient hospitalized for COPD started smoking again after discharge, which we know kind of is a recipe for disaster. So, um, you know, some people are just so ingrained in their, their habits that it's difficult to get them to change. And a number of patients 
they were uh, battling their chronic conditions for for years, like diabetes or heart disease, but they lacked information on how to care for their conditions. And I gave an example of that earlier. Uh, but then finally, if their doctor was affiliated with the hospital, um, there were better outcomes. And in some stories, it seemed to matter if the attending physician was affiliated to a specific, specific hospital or part of an outpatient clinic. Uh, and if there was not an affiliation, some patients were confused, again, about how to follow up on their care, who to go to if they became sick. So now that we have a good idea about the reasons for readmissions and the hospital's incentives to reduce them, we're going to move on to talk about how we as professionals can help patients transition smoothly from the hospital to the home setting. So we'll start by looking at steps to take before leaving the hospital, and then we'll look at the uh, first few hours, days, and of course the first 30 days after discharge. So we're going to start on the next slide with specific questions to ask. Planning for a smooth transition back home uh, can begin as soon as the person enters the hospital. So on the next slide here, we're going to look at some categories of questions. So being prepared begins with asking a lot of questions from the medical team and the patient and their families. So instead of listing out you know, every single question that you should ask, I kind of group them into categories uh, to help uh, families uh, kind of understand what they should be addressing or what they should be asking a, a professional about regarding their loved one. So patients and their caregivers should consult with the medical team, and this is usually, again, called that discharge plan, on uh, these specific needs. So they want to talk about what is the length of stay going to look like, the extent of the illness. Uh, they should get a feel of what he or she will and won't be able to do upon going home, uh, if there's any specific dietary concerns or nutritional needs. Of course, medication is huge. Medical equipment, follow-up care that might be required, uh, we're going to go over some warning signs here in just a little bit, but of course they'll want to know warning signs maybe for specific diseases that they have or chronic conditions. And then uh, assessing whether or not they're going to need assistance, whether that's short term or long term. And asking about finances, uh, insurance coverage, those types of things. Um, they would definitely want to know information regarding those topics. So. It's uh, really important to be prepared um, when going home, and that means making some adjustments around the home. So we're going to look a little bit closer at that on the next slide. So once they have the information that they need, they can begin to make the necessary uh, preparations for returning to the home. So something important would be purchase any medical equipment and have it delivered. So if they're going to now need a walker or if they would benefit from a toilet seat riser, those would be good things to have uh, purchased, delivered, sent to the home. Uh, also check with the pharmacy about medications and make sure that they will be available to the patient upon their return home. And then uh, safety improvements, that's huge. We want to make sure that the senior re returns to a safe environment. So that might be adding grab bars to the bathtub, removing rugs in frequented areas that could cause a trip or a fall. Uh, it might even be installing a permanent or temporary ramp in the home. Those are just a few examples, uh, but you kind of get the gist there. And then also, uh, the family will want to arrange for new rides to follow up medical appointments and therapy visits. Uh, and then one that often goes un un uh, unlooked is to clean out the refrigerator uh, and stock up on healthy foods and even change the linens especially if the person has been away from the home for a while. Uh, spoiled foods can, of course, make them ill, uh, could trigger a readmission. Uh, and who doesn't like to have clean sheets when they come home uh, from the hospital? Make sure they're nice and clean and sterile for that individual. But these little things can make a really big difference. And Home Instead has actually put together a great booklet called Returning Home. And in the booklet, it includes a discharge checklist. So I thought you might find this helpful when working with patients. So I typed out kind of a condensed version of it on the next slide.
And this Returning Home booklet can be downloaded for free on returninghome.com. I have that as a resource on the last slide. And I won't go this, through this line by line, but you can see uh, that it kind of covers everything, and especially those questions that I referred to earlier in the presentation. Um, things like, where is the individual being discharged to? Will they need help at home? What kind of help will they need? And if we transi transition to the next slide, that discharge checklist continues. And you all have access to these slides, so don't feel like you have to feverishly write down all this information. You can download the guide online or download the slides um, and print them off if needed. Uh, but again, these are simple things, and I feel like I'm stating the obvious, but if you've ever been in a crisis situation or under a lot of pressure, I know I tend to forget to ask certain questions or fail to get the accurate information. So this checklist um, and, and that returning home guide can really help families and professionals make sure that all the necessary information is communicated. So now that we've got a glimpse of this checklist, let's move on to the next slide and talk about those first few days back home from the hospital. So we know that the first few hours and days back home are the most critical. This is when watching for warning signs becomes important to ensure that the condition is under control. It's a good idea to keep a daily record of medications taken, meals eaten, activities undertaken, and the assistance provided. Uh, and that way, if a hospital readmission is needed or if you call a physician with a concern and they've asked, you know, well, what have they been eating or what kind of activities have they been up to? Um, have they had a wound dressing changed every day? If you have record of that, it makes it easier uh, to refer back to um, when talking to medical professionals. And of course, those warning signs we're going to get to in just a bit, uh, but those are really important. And for the caregivers, it's important during the first 30 days to make sure that the senior gets to all of their follow-up appointments and rehab appointments. Those are really critical. Um, those could reveal, um, or those, those types of appointments could entail blood tests that might reveal hidden issues or uh, making sure that those incisions or wounds are properly being cared for. Uh, they might involve x-rays or CT scans uh, that is ensuring that this individual is on the right track. So those follow-up appointments are really, really crucial. And then another common concern for seniors and their families is getting uh, transportation to these appointments. So seniors might need to ask family members, friends, local agencies, or even home care providers to help transport them to those really important uh, follow-up appointments. So let's take a look at those warning signs that I mentioned on the next slide. So during the first few days, it's especially important to watch out for these, these warning signs. And again, they might vary based on the chronic condition or um, the reason for the hospital readmission, uh, but some general problems that would warrant a doctor's call uh, would be things such as no bowel movements, uh, new skin problems, any changes in balance or coordination, even strength, um, changes in mental status or behavior. I know uh, a lot of times if a urinary tract infection happens, there's a lot of confusion by the patient. It almost seems like they all of a sudden have a dementia of some sort. So that could be, uh, that is definitely a warning sign to look out for, something you'd want to contact the doctor about. Um, and then uh, ineffective pain management, uh, if they're getting, if their medication's not, not doing the, the job or if it's causing, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, those types of things definitely want to contact the doctor. Um, if there's any medication issues um, or dizziness or fever. And then the more urgent warning signs that would warrant a, a 911 call would be, of course, falls, especially ones with bleeding or broken bones, uh, any severe or prolonged bleeding or pain. Uh, if you're unable to wake the senior, a new onset of slurred speech could indicate a stroke or a TIA. Uh, sudden weakness, uh, any ch chest pain uh, that the medication does not help, or increased difficulty breathing. So, of course, those are warning signs that you would want to call 911 in regards to. And then I've been talking about chronic conditions pretty, pretty much throughout the whole presentation today, and there are some chronic conditions that have specific things to watch for. So let's look at that on the next slide.
So a couple of these conditions, COPD and CHF, are two chron chronic conditions that are pretty common uh, and cause a lot of readmission. So as you can see on the chart, here are some small things that family caregivers professional caregivers can help with um, to help the patient manage their chronic conditions and avoid readmission. So of course for COPD, that CO2 monitoring uh, is really critical, uh, making sure that the home is at appropriate temperatures, um, we want to make sure that they're getting enough fluids, and then um, may even have to adjust their sleeping situations uh, to encourage comfort. And then for CHF, we want, again, make sure they're getting their fluids. Um, maintain an ordered diet, uh, those head hose are important, uh, if there's any changes in the skin color, those are things to watch for, um, and of course, scale and weight management, vital signs are really important there, um, and medication comes into play. There's a few more chronic conditions on the next slide that are also important to look out for. Pneumonia and diabetes are two more conditions that cause a lot of readmissions. So uh, when it comes to pneumonia, um, again, that, that oxygen compliance is important, uh, making sure that they're getting uh, some deep breathing exercises, um, some activity, uh, and making sure that they get proper follow-up to appointments, monitoring their vital signs. And diabetes, of course, diet plays a huge role. So uh, we want to make sure we're looking out for those signs of confusion, the hypoglycemia, uh, and then also measuring or testing blood sugars um, and making sure medication is administered properly, uh, encouraging exercises, and again, monitoring skin um, for uh, any warning signs there too. And I did want to mention, this is not on the slide, but dementia is another disease uh, that we need to kind of be aware of when we talk about readmission. Because people who have cognitive impairment, they might have trouble expressing if there's a problem or if they need medical assistance. So it's important uh, for a caregiver of someone with a cognitive impairment to really be in tune with their loved one's needs and contact their physician if they feel like um, their loved one with dementia is in need of assistance because, again, they can't always communicate if they're feeling pain. You know, they might act agitated instead. Uh, so being in tune with those um, types of things is very important. So, um, and. Pretty much all of these chronic condition tips uh, included something about medication. So I wanted to take a closer look at that on the next slide because, again, that can play a huge role in the readmission process or uh, reducing readmission. So when it comes to medication, sometimes patients inadvertently discontinue important medicines that they need to stay well. They might also um, might not have the right prescriptions uh, or be able to fill them. Sometimes the, uh, they stop medication due to a side effect or from the advice of a friend or family member. Um, if they feel like the medication is making them feel foggy, they might stop the medication altogether, which could certainly be detrimental to their health. And sometimes there's confusion. I mean, I mentioned my grandmother's story earlier about how upon discharge, um, her doctor changed the medication um, and she, she didn't ask questions, and so our family was trying to figure out, what's this medication for? And I know a lot of times people on blood thinners, after they leave a hospital stay, that level of blood thinner, the dosage rather, um, might change. So even little changes in medication they're already taking, those might occur. So it's important um, to kind of do a med reconciliation, make sure that the medications that the senior's taking uh, match up with what's on the discharge plan, making sure that the medical professionals are in communication. So um, if medi uh, medication management systems are always a great idea for seniors to make sure that they're taking the recommended medication uh, properly. So we all know the, the MediSet, I have a picture of it up there on the screen, or um, companies like Philips have an automated medication dispenser that gives reminders. Uh, Simple Meds, um, they also have a mail order pre-dose package medication system. So there are solutions out there that will help with compliance of medication. And because it plays such a big role, um, I wanted to highlight it here. So um, in addition to medication, I've talked a lot about that. I've also talked a lot about the family caregiver and that support system for the patient. Um, so let's look a little bit closer at that on the next slide here. 
Oftentimes, uh, upon discharge from the hospital, it's recommended that the patient has some sort of support at home. So it's important to determine, uh, you know, how long they need that support. Is it a few days a week, uh, every day? Is it ongoing? Um, when is the care most important? Is it during the day? Is it during the evening? Maybe even overnight assistance. Uh, I would find that oftentimes my clients, when they would come home from the hospital, uh, we would have kind of around-the-clock care between professional caregivers, family caregivers, making sure that patient wasn't alone for the first couple days or weeks. But then as the patient regained their strength, uh, got to their back to their everyday activities, uh, that monitoring, that uh, support kind of weaned off, um, again, as they began to get back to their old selves. Um, so again, determine whether a family is available to help, um, especially in today's world, people are working outside the home, they might not be able to be there all the time. So determining if other support services are needed, such as um, home health care or home care, um, is really important. And so often home health is a service that is paid for upon discharge from a hospital by Medicare. Um, and sometimes seniors get confused when talking about home health versus home care. Uh, home care is not covered by Medicare, but can certainly be uh, an important part of that support system going home. So I thought we would dive a little bit deeper into when home care might be needed on the next slide. I mentioned that in today's world, Families are so busy. Sometimes kids are living halfway across the country and their parents on the other half. Um, so getting some extra support may be necessary depending on the means and the situation. Um, so some examples of how home care uh, can assist are listed there on the slide. Um, so things like medication management, making sure they get to those appointments, making sure that they're getting nutrition, nutritious meals, uh, making sh watching out for those warning signs. Um, it can really make a big difference to have that extra set of eyes and ears and helping hands in there, um, especially after discharge from the hospital. So um, Home Instead wanted to kind of prove this, and so we did a pilot, um, and we wanted to see if home care could truly reduce the, the readmission rate once patients returned home from the hospital. So I wanted to share that pilot that we did with you, so we'll transition to that on the next slide. This transitional care pilot program was designed to determine whether patient compliance with hospital discharge instructions and monitoring of key indicators that drive quality outcomes in the home would create, uh, would correlate, pardon me, to reduce unnecessary hospital readmissions with those high risk patients, and, uh, especially within that first 30 days of discharge. So uh, we worked with two hospitals in the Detroit area to complete this home care study uh, for their patients with CHF or COPD, um, which are the CMS readmission penalty diagnoses. So we wanted to be strategic about that. Um, we did this over seven months um, and focused on 30 patients. So let's look at the uh, criteria, admission criteria on the next page for the, or next slide, pardon me, for this study. So referrals were made based on the criteria listed here on the slide. Um, of the 30 patients, 10 were discharged with CHF, 20 were discharged with COPD, and in most instances, there was a comorbidity of both diagnoses along with other comorbidities. And all 30 patients had a history of one or more recent hospitalizations in the past year, and they were known to the emergency department staff, kind of those frequent flyers, the people that are around quite often. So once those people were identified, we implemented a process of delivering home care. So let's look at that on the next slide. So each plan was individualized for the patient's unique needs and goals. It started with a minimum of one hour of care for five visits um, a week with decreasing hours after that first week. And since we were using a client teach back method, it allowed the patients to learn how to recognize issues and gain confidence in their own care. And this allowed us to taper off the hours uh, with a decreasing need. So teaching the patients in this manner increased their competency and their confidence as time went on. 
and each week the team met to discuss the current plan of care and determine if the hours could be adjusted on the client's, uh, based on the client's response to the home care. So how did the results turn out? Let's look at those on the next slide. I would say that this study produced some pretty solid results. It's pretty amazing. So 93% of the patients were discharged to their own home and remained there. Um, the results also show that 96% of patients remained out of the hospital for 30 days post-discharge. Um, and then we followed those patients further, and at 60 days, 93% uh, were able to stay out of the hospital. And after 90 days, 90% of the patients remained out of the hospital and in their own home. So uh, not only did we keep those individuals out of the hospital for the most part, when they were surveyed, 100% of the participants agreed that they understood their care and felt better than they had in the past. So given this little bit of care, one hour, five days a week, uh, and then tapering it off from there, that really made a huge impact on these patients. So home care can truly be of value. Um, having that little extra help, that one-on-one -on -one care can go a long way and help patients better understand how to care for themselves. So I know I've gone over a ton of information today, and I wanted to make sure that I got you the resources that I've been promising along the way. So let's take a look at that resource slide next. So first, that returning home guide, and I mentioned it is downloadable. There's a picture there of the website. It's also uh, part of the caregiverstress.com site. Uh, but on there, there's all sorts of the, the discharge checklist, tips, advice, um, five ways on how to prevent senior hospitalization, those types of things. I also, um, we talked a lot, a lot about medication management, and I mentioned simplemedsrx.com, uh, Simple Meds is a, a great resource for that. Uh, caregiverstress.com I mentioned. Uh, and then if you wanted to read more details on that pilot study um, that I went over, I, I included the link there. It's, it was called the Enhanced Transitional Care Pilot. So feel free to read that in more detail. And then um, that revolving door report that I referred to a lot. I wanted to give you the link there uh, for you to check out on, on your own time if you need needed some additional resources or information. So I know we have about 15 minutes here left for questions. Lanita, have you joined us? I am here. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And again, Lanita is our healthcare strategist here at Home Instead, and she um, is very well versed in the readmission program and reducing hospital readmissions. So excited to have her here. And uh, she's been a nurse for several years, so it's always great to get her perspective uh, from the nursing world. So, uh, Lenita, I'm not sure if you caught that poll at the beginning, but we have a lot of social workers, a lot of discharge planners, and other healthcare professionals on the line today. So, um, I'm excited to open it up for some questions. So, Steve, do we have any questions coming in? Yes, we do. Great presentation, Lakeland. Thank you very much, and welcome, Lenita. Thank you. Um, it is time for the questions and answers, everybody. So, send in your questions. Um, let's get to it. Here. First question for you. Um, what about a situation about um, a person's adamant refusal about going to rehab and insisting on going straight home because they believe they can take care of themselves? That is a tough question. I uh, encountered that a lot. Um, when working with clients, they thought that they could return home without any assistance. Um, you know, going to rehab is always uh, or not always, in a lot of cases, a great option. Um, if going home with therapies at home, um, you know, PT, OT in the home, if that's an option, um, that would be, you know, um, a good alternative to going to an actual rehab facility, I would say. Uh, Lenita, did you have any thoughts beyond that? Um, well, I guess my first thought is most of the time um, rehab's prescribed, so it's um, usually a physician's order um, or very much highly suggested that the, by the physician. So I would say working with the discharge planners and social workers at the hospital to um, help that senior understand why it's necessary and then that just because you're going to rehab doesn't mean you have to stay there 90 or 100 days. Maybe you only need 30 days to get you prepared 
to go to home and then be supported in the home with home health and home care. And it's just changing their mindset and using whatever, whoever um, is available to help explain that. And especially if it's a doctor's order, um, it's really working with those hospital people to um, convince them that that is the best path. I would agree with that, Juanita. And I also um, had worked with several seniors where we would try to goal set. So I would talk to them about, you know, okay, you want to go home. Well, when you're home, what are your goals? Um, and they would often say things like, you know, I want to be walking again without a walker or, or a cane, or um, I want to be able to get back to going to my knitting class each week. Uh, so then I would use those goals to kind of as a way to convince them, um, you know, well, in order to get to point A of using not using a walker anymore and point B of getting back to your knitting classes, we're going to need to build up your strength. And the things that will do that are, um, you know, making sure you get to your therapies, eating enough uh, protein and healthy diet, those types of things. So sometimes um, you can almost turn it back on them and say, uh, okay, your goal is to go home. Um, let's try to figure out how that can be done successfully. So I hope that that helps and answer that question. Okay. Um, next question here. Are dietitians and nutritionists getting involved pre and post discharge and how? That's another great question. Um, we're not seeing as much of it as we would like to see. I, I believe nutrition and diet is key, um, especially, and it really showed in both the studies that we did how key nutrition, having nutritious food available and following any of the discharge plans with diet are. Um, unfortunately, what we see mostly, most of the time is that once they leave a facility, that nutritional counseling and the nutritionists and the dietitians that are involved gets less and less and less, if, if at all. So we've tried to um, encourage that um, using whatever method is possible. If the hospital dietitian or the facility dietitian or nutritionist can't work with the senior, we have other avenues. Um, many of the places such as Hy-Vee has their own um, dietitians on staff and working with them, they actually have come and presented at, at different events for us because they can actually jump in and actually um, take over from the, from the discharge forward. And to clarify like, for those of you who don't live in a community with a Hy-Vee, that's just the local grocery store that we have here. So um, there are dietitians available to the community in other ways. I know a lot of senior centers across the U.S., um, they have um, access to a nutritionist, so you could always use that. And then also on caregiverstress.com, we tapped into our grocery store Hy-Vee nutritionist, and she helped us come up with some great kind of templated um, or pre- um, oh gosh, what's the word, prefixed menus for um, people with certain conditions or if they're trying to stay within a certain calorie count and they're all geared towards seniors. So if you go to caregiverstress.com and type in recipes in the search bar, it'll bring up those recipes uh, that that dietitian created for us. Uh, and again, they're really great. There's a nice variety um, and there's all the nutritional facts there. Uh, so there are some other avenues uh, to get that nutrition assistance uh, and uh, advice or counseling. Right. The next question here for you is, um, I'm a social worker at a senior apartment complex. I see a lot of readmissions due to the residents' lack of family support after discharge. Can you give me some advice on how I can assist the resident with reintegrating into the community? And I know you're not alone, uh, whoever wrote that in. Thank you for that great question. This is uh, a commonality among a lot of um, senior living communities. Um, of course, making sure that the environment that they're in is safe. Um, again, that returning home guide on returninghome.com has a great checklist, but there's also, if you go to caregiverstress.com and type in home safety, there's a whole home safety, safety checklist that will come up. Um, but also letting them know, making them aware of 
other resources in your local community in terms of maybe home care companies that could assist. We find that um, there are a lot of um, seniors out there where their children don't live in the same uh, general areas they do. They might not have family. Uh, so having that extra added layer of support in terms of a home care company can be a great benefit. Um, and they can be, usually most home care companies, um, they can tailor the schedule to meet their needs, um, to meet their financial situation as well. And a lot of times I found that the adult children would pay for the service because they couldn't be there to help their loved one. Um, but making sure that they are aware of the resources in the community. Some, uh, there are also volunteer organizations out there if they don't have the means to pay for home care. Um, a lot of local churches have assistance programs such as that, but um, making sure their environment's safe, making sure they're getting good and proper nutrition, so keeping an eye out for if they're coming down for meals, if that community offers meal time, um, those sorts of things. Lanita, did you have anything else to add? I, no, actually, I think you covered that one pretty well. Um. Okay. Um, next question here, what are the main warning signs for determining that an individual can no longer live in an independent setting? That's a great question. Um, well, some warning signs would be um, if they're unable to um, get around uh, the home safely, even when it comes to so more so if they're unable to, you know, transfer in and out of a wheelchair, for example, um, or um, if if they're unable to, you know, properly bathe themselves safely. Um, and then if bringing in, um, you know, an out, outside provider, um, a bath aid or home care company, if if um, if they have tried that and you know they're still struggling. Um, to maintain their independence in the home, then it might be um, time to look into alternate levels of care. However, um, just because somebody moves from a home setting to a care community uh, doesn't necessarily um, mean that um, that it's kind of the end all end all be all. Um, you know, some assisted living facilities have certain criteria where the individual still has to be able to transfer with a one-person assist, or if it becomes more of a two-person assist, that would be a criteria for a nursing home. Um, and nursing home care um, can be rather expensive. Um, there's not always room in nursing homes. Um, in a lot of communities, they're filling up fast. Uh, so, I mean, it really depends on the situation. Uh, it depends on the individual, the resources available to them. I wouldn't say that there are, um, you know, like three things that will determine whether or not a person can remain independently at home. It's kind of looking at uh, the situation as a whole. Um, Lenita, any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, there's all kinds of different things you can look at out there that'll say, oh, if this happens or that happens, um, it's time to look at assisted living. But honestly, I think um, if you're living in the same community um, with your senior, you'll there are certain things that start start popping up. Their chronic health condition gets worse, or they've had recent accidents, or maybe even close calls or almost fall uh, near falls, um, or that they're just having so much difficulty managing their activities of daily living, and it and even with um, someone in the home, it's still just getting um, more and more difficult. So I think it's things that you'll notice as time goes on. Sometimes if you're too close to it, people, I mean, even myself as a nurse could easily miss it in my own loved ones. Um, but sometimes it's the neighbor that notices it and you're coming and going. They'll say, hey, I noticed that your mom's lost a lot of weight lately or she seems a little more frail. I think listening to those comments and not just brushing them off, which is what we tend to do because our, we don't want to think about our loved ones um, declining. But I don't think they're, I mean, you could easily Google it and you'd probably come up with a hundred different ones that say, here are 10 signs that'll tell you that it's time to move. Um, but I think it's personalized. I think it's knowing your 
your senior and your loved one and, and knowing and being aware that changes are going to happen and being conscious of those changes and when those changes get too much. And if you already have a caregiver in your home, it may be just listening to that caregiver say, you know, I know your mom's really getting to a point where it's hard to help her in and out of bed or it takes more than just assistance. It's actually maybe it's time to get a, um, a lift or something else. It's listening to those keys because that person that's with them the most is going to really drive their need, what they need, and because they see it, they know how much more they're putting into it. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thanks. Also on uh, caregiverstress.com, um, there's a home care solution guide um, that kind of goes over, you know, when is home care needed, what is it, um, when it's like home health care. So it can kind, of, those can kind of that guide can help guide uh, the family um, to help identify. Um, some of the signs. Um, so that might be a good resource. Again, caregiverstress.com. Okay. And uh, speaking of resources, um, the next question, do you have any resources to assist financially to pay for home care since it is not covered by Medicare? Yes. Um, it depends on the individual. It depends on their situation. Um, Medicaid does have a waiver to pay for home care. Um, now, granted, not all home care providers accept Medicaid waiver, um, but that is an option for some seniors. Um, a lot of um, the AAAs, the area agencies on aging, they offer um, assistance on kind of a sliding scale in a lot of communities. Uh, and you can dial 211. I've learned that from people sharing resources through these webinars. If you call 211, they can connect you with your local area agency on aging, or you can go to AAA.org. Um, also, there's, uh, if they're a vet, a, a veteran, they can um, look to the VA to see if they qualify for any um, home care assistance. Um, a lot of times, if the vet has cognitive impairment, I found that they uh, they do provide some benefit to the veterans in that situation. Um, for those with Alzheimer's or dementia, there is a grant program that grants care um, to those family caregivers, and it's called Hilarity for Charity. If you go to helpforalzheimersfamilies.com, again, help for Alzheimer's families.com or if you just Google hilarity for charity um, that grant program is available for people to apply for um, am I missing anything Juanita in terms of um, the ways to only find other care? one I mean you met, you mentioned I think just about all of them that we're aware of um, the only thing I would probably add in is Medicare does have some programs. Um, probably the most well known is the PACE program. Um, not in every community, but in the communities that it is in, they do cover care for um, seniors. And I think you mentioned, um, I mean, it's looking at, at the resources that you have. There's all kinds of things out there. Um, and we actually did do a booklet on it uh, about a resource on it about a year ago um, that kind of covered everything that Lakeland just said, you know, that there's um, the PACE program and then there's the veterans benefits and then there's different fi um, financial pieces such as like a reverse mortgage is the one that comes to mind the most that help and guide them. Yeah, and long-term care insurance, if they have that, mm -hmm. oftentimes they will cover care in the home. Um, so again, caregiverchef.com has a lot of great resources if you type in finance finances or paying for care into that site, it can help direct you to um, some resources. And I know we're at the top of the hour, but next year, I'm going to plug one more time the CEO program next year. I do cover um, different types of care in some of the upcoming topics and how to pay for care. So tune in to the upcoming year's webinar and you can learn even more about that topic. So I'll send it back to you, Steve, after my shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> no shame there. 
Um, yes, as you mentioned, Lakeland, um, unfortunately we have reached the end of our hour here and we're just about out of time. But I want to thank you for another great presentation. And Lenita, I want to thank you for joining us as well today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.